Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 437 537 with me, Dr. Matt Barton, today discussing the subject of social media ethics. It's a really big topic. It's something that we've really wanted to focus on as part of our professional communication program. Uh, so we really want to delve into this topic, see if we can understand all of the ramifications and facets of it. And as we'll soon see, there's very little in the way of uh, one-size-fits-all uh, solutions here, but there are certainly things we can do uh, to at least strive towards a more ethical situation at our workplace. Uh, anyway, here's an overview of our lesson objectives. We'll be talking about uh, understanding our audience's needs and what they prefer. Uh, how to attract interactors or users to our blogs or websites or Twitter feeds and how to keep them coming back. That's a good one. Uh, developing and using a style guide for clarity, consistency, and efficiency. Uh, not necessarily my favorite topic, but an important one. And then uh, we'll get into this all-important topic, I think, of the code of ethics. How do you develop something like that? Uh, what sort of system do you need in place? How can you uh, communicate this? And, of course, how do you, uh, you know, the idea will be how can you develop this before you need it? <laughs> You're going to need it sooner or later, so the uh, goal is to have it ready uh, for when the inevitable thing happens. And let's go uh, start off with Martin here, as usual. Uh, so she opens up this chapter. I think it's called something like asking or don't ask uh, for forgiveness. Don't ask permission, ask for forgiveness. <laughs> what is the name of the chat? Let me uh, make sure we get that right. Uh, ask forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> uh, this is something you hear a lot. Uh, advice, I don't know. It's kind of interesting to run that through the ethical ringer, uh, that advice. But, but anyway, she talks about the senator, and she doesn't tell us who the senator was. And I guess we could probably find out if you Googled this. Uh, but the idea is some kind of affair, scandal, something came out, and this senator, I'm going to assume it's a guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know for sure. <laughs> Pretty sure she uses uh, he to talk about uh, him, but anyway, some kind of affair. This leaks out, and they're trying to figure, basically, do damage control. You know, like what do we do now? And so they approached Martin and Digital, her company, Digital Royalty, asking, "Hey, can we hire you to come in, manage this thing for us on social media, and, and somehow ameliorate the the situation?" And she seemed a little, you know, I guess for her it was sort of one of those things where, yeah, this is a very high profile. This is a senator. You know, this might do. This would be uh, this could be good for the company. On the other hand, <laughs> it could go very horribly wrong. Certainly, won't, wouldn't want to become associated and tangled with some uh, something really hideous. Uh, so basically, her advice. I guess it, they ended up not going with it anyway. Uh, the senator turned them down, or the senator's a PR people. But, but the idea was that and we'll see that the same thing comes up in curl. This idea of you know if you don't already have this in place. You know, if you wait until the emergency, the crisis, and then try to, to launch it, then it's just too little, too late. Nobody's going to buy it, uh, no matter how great of an actor or how sincere. You know, maybe the senator's completely sincere uh, with the apologies and, uh, and that sort of thing, but it, just the fact that the timing is suspect is, is going to make people suspicious, right? So you didn't have that relationship, and now suddenly you're trying to uh, create one out of uh, thin air. Uh, doesn't really work. So I think Martin's pretty smart here. I like this. Uh, you know, I'm glad she didn't end up <laughs> trying to, uh, trying to uh, take on this case. I think it was the right call, or whether it was up to her or not. Uh, but she says the primary challenge is authenticity. All right, so this is always the challenge. And especially, you know, I've been reading some of the nuggets, and a lot of people are, you know, they're saying, well, these are. It's, I'm already suspicious. You know, this is a big company. Or this is a big celebrity. I'm a little dubious as to their authenticity. Writer, politician. I mean, nobody really trusts them. <laughs> I would, would hope. Uh, so you're kind of dealing with this already. And the last thing you want to do is to make it worse. Okay, so let's start off here. I have a... It's kind of a fascinating just to me that as a rhetorical genre. The apology... And there's, you can find books about this, you know, how to properly apologize and, you know, what, what is the difference, what is an apology? You know, people try to define the term and get 
<laughs> they get confused even there. <laughs> and you have this thing called like a fake apology or that wasn't an apology. That uh, So even beyond like the sincerity stuff. But, but anyway, I won't uh, burden you with that. So just let's just take a look at these this list here. It's on grunge.com. The worst apologies on the internet. So there's a bunch of them there. I watched the one with uh, Martha Stewart a while ago. Uh, but there's many more to choose from. Basically, these are celebrities, companies. Uh, they basically screwed up. They did something unethical. And then they came back and tried to apologize for it in the form of a video. Uh, so, first of all, since it's on a page called the <laughs> worst apologies, <laughs> clearly something didn't quite work out. Uh, so first, just look at the video. If you don't know the situation that led to the apology, there's a little blurb there. So you can kind of get up to speed. But anyway, read that. See if you could figure out, like, what happened here? Why didn't this apology work as intended? Uh, and then consider the difference. So some of these people are were active on social media already. Uh, that was their business model. Uh, other ones didn't really have anything like that. Uh, but I just want you to think, in light of what we've been reading in Martin, what difference could it have made? You know, if they did have this well-established social media presence, uh, could they have made a better apology uh, than if they didn't. All right, and here's this idea of the polished veneer. Uh, Martin's kind of following uh, somebody like Marshall McLuhan looking at the media at work. And the traditional media, she means, I guess, anything from the old uh, broadcast television to up through cable TV. Uh, radio, but basically that sort of one-way model, you know, we, we turn on, back when I was a kid, you know, you turn on the TV, there'd be four or five channels, you know, that's basically your source of information, I guess you could read newspapers and whatever, uh, but there wasn't anything like this uh, Twitter feed, uh, or, heck, I can remember when it was a big deal if a company even had a website, like, wow, Heinz Ketchup has a website, <laughs> how bizarre, <laughs> uh, but now we've got all this stuff where these companies are trying to Get, let us get to know them and some do it better than others it's kind of this strange new world that we're living in I don't know if you there was a Pepsi one I was just looking at around Valentine's Day and they were it was kind of fun because they had Mountain Dew and some of these other companies uh, proposing to Pepsi <laughs> like what the heck's going on I don't know it's just kind of fun uh, to think about uh, but anyway she says that now we can get to know these brands if they're willing to let us in. So you could stick, try to stick to the old model where you sort of control all the information. It's all done through ads and very carefully scripted interviews and whatnot. Uh, I think it makes more, you know, she's talking here about people like you know, The Rock and, uh, and, and Dana uh, from uh, the use, uh, Ultimate Fighting Championships. But I really see, where I see this, maybe it's just because I'm more interested in politics uh, or the talking head type stuff than the, the sports. You know, but I think this is what really, you know, that's where I see what she's talking about coming into play. You know, it's, it's, it used to be sufficient for these politicians, if they're running for president or whatever. You know, they do some ads, they do some interviews, and that's about it, right? Nobody, there wasn't this push to like, I want to know what this person's like behind the scenes. <laughs> you just, that was all kind of up to the imagination. Uh, but now increasingly we're seeing uh, the, let me turn this off, geez. Uh, we're seeing that they're they are trying to reach out and we'll look at some examples of that you know and try to make you feel like uh, you know you're seeing into their daily life not just their public persona so Martin thinks that's the right tack it's just not only is that old strategy ineffective it can actually damage a brand's credibility in this in that the uh, idea might be that you know what are they trying to hide why are they so guarded about their private life. Why is this person refusing to get on Twitter or do one of these uh, tell-all or ask-anything type situations? You know, what, what are they trying to hide? Uh, that can actually enter people's minds. Uh, so here's our second question. So I found this other page. You know, I've been doing uh, my homework too. Uh, I found this list of the celebrities, or the, I guess the biggest celebrities who don't use social media. So they have decided to just stay off the Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, whatever. And they've got their various uh, rationales for why they have chosen to do so. 
So I thought that we could learn something from this. And so let's take a look at this page. And then uh, after you've read a couple of these, uh, see if you can answer this. How do you think staying off social media, so going against Martin, uh, has affected their fans, their relationship with their fans, their audience, as well as the general public's view of their caring trustworthiness and consciousness? Uh, so how do you think this decision has, has affected them in those, in those categories? Uh, so answer that, come back, and we will continue. All right, so I thought I'd bring in a couple extra theories, uh, some other ways you might approach some of these questions. You know, Martin and Carol aren't especially theoretical. Uh, Carol does get, he'll mention a lot of studies, uh, and I think he, do, he does have that bit about Kenneth Burke that I like, but there's just a few other ones I wanted to uh, add to the mix. Uh, some of these we talk about in my rhetoric of pop culture class. Uh, some of them... Uh, you could find elsewhere, but just, just, just you know, just a couple of other options if you wanted to pursue this. Uh, one is called the parasocial interaction, or PSI. <laughs> so, uh, this is a term coined by Donald Horton and Richard, I think this is Wall, in 1956. So it's coming out of psychology, a kind of psychological relationship experienced by an audience in their mediated encounters, in other words, uh, through TV or I suppose Twitter, whatever. Uh, with performers in the mass media, particularly on television. So basically, they don't know these people in real life. I don't know Dwayne The Rock and <laughs> Johnson. Never met the guy, ever. Probably never will. Uh, yet, we I do encounter him, you know, as we said, in all these various uh, formats. See him on TV, see him in movies. Those are mediated encounters, but I think we could also add his Twitter feed uh, as a mediated encounter. So anyway, the PSI happens when the viewers come to consider media personalities as friends despite that. So somebody might feel like they really know Dwayne. Or the, a lot of these reality shows, I feel like that's their purpose. You feel like, I really know, you know, uh, like the Duck Dynasty people or the Kardashians or <laughs> whatever the case may be. Uh, it's like a, you know, not, they don't feel so distant from us. Uh, because of PSI, we feel like we kind of know them, uh, even though we've never met them uh, or had a conversation of any sort with them. So PSI is described as an illusionary experience, such that media audiences interact with a persona, e.g. a talk show host, a celebrity, a fictional character, a social media influencer, as if they are engaged in a reciprocal relationship with them. So it almost sounds like some kind of clinical uh, <laughs> a malady here. Uh, but on the other hand, I just, I just think this is just kind of how it works, right? And I'm sure you know people who uh, who do. I remember when I was in college, there was a, a girl I was friends with who, you know, to say that she liked Star Trek Voyager it was a, the understatement of the year. <laughs> I, mean, like, I mean, she the way she would talk about like what was going on in the episodes and the characters, she, you, I, you would think that she was talking about like other groups of friends that I just never had uh, met, you know, like this other circle of friends of hers. And then you'd finally realize, oh, she's talking about Voyager. <laughs> it, was, it was just a little bit, you know, at the time I thought it was, it's almost a little bit, you know, you kind of wonder... <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> you know, this sounds like it's, it's moved beyond uh, just being a fan to, to some other category. And I think it was this PSI uh, happening. But I think to some degree uh, that happens to all of us. Uh, then we have the concept of vicarious participation. So I had to kind of dig around to find this, a uh, good definition of this. But uh, this is uh, when you see an advertisement. And this study was using an old gain soap or detergent advertisement. Uh, the idea is you see this character in the ad, and you start, and certain consumers begin to feel as if they are participating in that character's experiences. Consumers imaginatively experience the story events from the affective and cognitive perspectives of the character with whom they are identify. So the idea is this develops over time, right? Initially, you just uh, maybe you're participating by the thoughts, perceptions, uh, but as this deepens, the vicarious participation will generally intensify to include emotional reactions and sometimes physical reactions. And in rare instances, so note they say rare, I don't know how rare it is though, 
sometimes uh, these uh, empathizing consumers may feel as though they have actually lived through uh, the story events. So this is the basic strategy behind almost every television commercial. With any, if it's got any kind of story element, you know, sometimes it'll be set up as, you know, the guy has just been fired, or he's what's the one I'm seeing all the time now? It's a uh, having trouble sleeping <laughs> right so they'll try to put a character in there that you can kind of identify with uh, so the idea here is you can kind of vicariously participate now when this comes up in 306 uh, the author of that book so now and she talks about these uh, uh, volunteer organizations the charity organizations you know, they're trying to collect money for things and they talk about it in terms of uh, why you know why would you donate money to something like the the uh, Humane Society or the uh, the Red Cross you know that sort of thing or the various ads for children uh, with medical conditions uh, and the idea is they they will say send, you know send five dollars send ten dollars uh, but then they link it to vicarious participation they'll say by doing this you will be doing your part you'll be helping you know the doctors and nurses or whoever it is to, to actually help the uh, uh, you know, the children or the animals or whatever. Uh, so the idea is it's vicarious participation. We kind of feel good about that. We feel like we've kind of done our part, even though we haven't really done anything. <laughs> but, you know, but maybe uh, send some money or maybe even just like to post on Facebook. And you think, well, I feel pretty good about that. You know, I've done my part. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, so that's the idea of vicarious. You know, you haven't actually done it, but you sort of done it through uh, somebody else, right? I don't know if I'm explaining this concept too well, but uh, that's the idea. Uh, and then uh, Kenneth Burke, just to kind of bring it back to him again, he talks a lot of, in his work about this term identification. And so you remember, Burke doesn't really talk about persuasion the same way Aristotle and some of these classical orators uh, do. It's for him, it's not like you go up and give a great speech and everybody switches to your point of view. Uh, instead, it's a lot more about groups and you know, who do you identify with. And, uh, to use modern parlance, you'd say, do you, you know, who do you, where do you feel like you belong? You know, are these, are these your people? You know, I often think about this again to bring it back to politics, and you find uh, some people think it's unusual when they will ask you something like, "What party are you? What party are, do you belong to? And what are your political views? You know, and do you did you know uh, that your party supports this and that?" A lot of times they really don't know or care about that stuff, right? They just, you know, the, the reason they're part of that group is because they identify with the other members of that group, right? They've, they've seen the two groups or the three groups, and they've taken a look. They've hung out enough to know that, you know, this is, I feel more comfortable over here with this group than I do with that group over there. Even though maybe this other group, you know, maybe uh, mentally, intellectually, maybe I agree with some of what they're saying. Uh, it just, I don't identify with them. They, you know, I don't feel like I'm at home. I don't feel like I belong. Uh, so that's sort of, uh, you know, I think you're in kind of Burkean territory when you're thinking along those lines. And so Burke argues that you persuade or communicate, uh, I would just say, with the person, <laughs> or you, you persuade or communicate only in so far as you talk uh, somebody's language by speech, a gesture, tonality, order, image, attitude, ideas, identifying your ways with theirs. So I think, you know, it's like, that person's one of us, right? <laughs> they used to always talk about the, you know, I would have, who would you rather have a beer with? You know, would you rather have a beer with, uh, oh, who was it, uh, McCain or John Kerry or whatever, you know? Uh, that's the idea. You know, who's more like you? because that's the one that you'll probably be more likely to support. And I think we can come back to that idea, idea of the vicarious participation. But, but anyway, here's the, let's see if we can pull this up quick. This is the, let's see, is that going to work? Yeah, so here's an example of this, again, from politics, of uh, Elizabeth, Senator Elizabeth Warren drinking a beer on Instagram live. I don't know if the sound is... Over. My husband Bruce okay. is now in here. Um, you want a beer? No, I'll pass on the beer for now. You sure? Okay. Oh, yes. Say hello to folks. yes. So okay. this is my sweetie. Hello. Um, he's the best. And I'm uh, crazy. I love you. I love you too. Thank you for being here. 
Pleasure. I'm glad you're here. Enjoy your beer. So, who have we got here so far? Um. <laughs> Uh, so that was, uh, I think, a pretty self-conscious effort uh, to identify, right? trying to get people to say, look, I'm just an everyday person. I drink a beer. Uh, I drink beer. I don't drink, you know, whatever the $40,000 bottles of wine or whatever the case may be. Uh, so putting all the politics aside, you know, I, this, uh, kind of irrelevant for this uh, purpose here, uh, I just want you to see, you know, the efforts that, uh, politicians will go to because they're aware of this, right? If if you if a voter feels like that person's not like me, uh, the person lives in a different world. Uh, sometimes people talk about university professors and they'll say this this professor just kind of lives in an ivory tower. <laughs> it's or this this college class is just so far removed from practical uh, concerns. Uh, so it's that same sort of idea. So one of the challenges is you know if you want people to. Uh, to support you, you have to make sure that they identify that they feel like they're part of the movement, part of the group, uh, that you are like them. And that's the basic lesson there. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to some lessons for renegades. Uh, let's see. Now, this is from um, Martin again. Keep it organic. Let the fans talk back when, where, and how they want to. Don't try to force it. Uh, so this happens sometimes. You a lot of the companies are so worried about security and somebody posting something inappropriate or they're sensitive they don't want like criticism uh, negative comments on their feed in any way so they'll go in and try to force it they just try to find ways to sort of uh, strongly encourage people to particip participate in it. it just doesn't really work well you know if you give people a little more freedom and as to how they want to interact it'll probably work out better uh, let's see. Offer low barrier engagement. Uh, make it easy to contribute. No forums, registration. So you don't want people to have to sign up for an account and then put a credit card number and all this stuff and give you a bunch of sensitive information. Uh, go through a process, you know, just to be able to post comments and things. Uh, you want to make it easy. You know, and of course, the downside of that is uh, the lower that barrier, the more likely it is to get spammers and bots. But you know, have to find. There's a trade-off there, basically. And then uh, measuring the, ensuring the real-time results, remind them that they're part of a much larger community. How many people, uh, oh, that's my, my addition. And so one of the things that I think is sort of attractive about multiplayer games, uh, World of Warcraft or whatever the case is, is that you, uh, you can find out like how many people are playing with you. You know, you're running around, you're seeing other people there. Uh, or if you're on Steam, playing games on there, it'll tell you like how many people are playing this. Uh, so somehow that makes you feel like it's not so, you don't feel so lonely or alienated or <laughs> weird about playing it so much. <laughs> and you're kind of able to tell how many other people are watching this. Uh, or the same thing with Amazon. You notice they'll put the not just the sales of the book, but you know how many people posted reviews. How many, and same thing with Facebook. Like how many people are liking this post? Uh, how many people are on uh, Facebook at that moment? If you're on uh, YouTube or Instagram, you you could see the on the Warren clip, people were act like live uh, posting, you know, as that thing was going on, which that's that alone is worth watching that video just to study that, because you can see how it's not just you watching, you know, uh, Warren, it's all the people uh, that are also watching and they're commenting and you know you could comment back or just read whether you comment back or not. Uh, isn't so important as just being uh, reminded like there's other people I'm part of this larger community okay here we have the information rich versus sensory oriented now we're moving into uh, the Carol book uh, so he's asking us some questions basically trying to figure out you know you got something you want to communicate how do you do it uh, the first question is basically what medium do you want to use you say social media, but there's a, you know, as we know, there's a big spectrum. You know, everything from Wikipedia to YouTube to TikTok to what, <laughs> what have you. <laughs> so the first thing is just thinking about the audience in terms of, you know, what do they prefer? Do they like an information-rich medium? And he, uh, Carol says, Wikipedia is like that. Lots and lots of information. <laughs> Man, <laughs> he's not wrong. I mean, you could look for... Uh, Kenneth Burke, and there's like a whole thing about Kenneth Burke identification. You can really get lost in the weeds 
uh, in that. Uh, so, but some material, any you know, any kind of reference. Uh, if you want to learn about Kenneth Burke, I'd probably go to Wikipedia. You know, that's where you're going to get a lot of info. Uh, or maybe you want a more sensory oriented experience. And of course, YouTube would be better for that. Videos. You know, if I want to know how to, <clears throat> I was a, I got a new air fryer. <laughs> So I'm not getting on YouTube because I want to find out, like, how do I do frozen biscuits in the air fryer? And I'm probably not going to go to Wikipedia for that. You know, you, you go to, to YouTube so you could see somebody uh, with a unit like mine, and you can sort of see it play out. And Plus, they have fun personalities, and I like to laugh. At least the, the YouTubers I like, they they have a lot of fun. And that kind of coming back to that vicarious participation, uh, it's just kind of fun to watch that, sort of imagine you're there with them in the kitchen uh, cooking up the, <laughs> the frozen biscuits. But... <laughs> Uh, but anyway, it's certainly true. Uh, you know, some, you don't always want that information-rich experience, right? Sometimes you do want something more sensory. It doesn't necessarily mean it's less sophisticated or it's lacking in detail. Uh, it just appeals to more than just your, you know, you're doing more than just reading. You're watching and seeing stuff move around and the voice of the tone, uh, the tone of the voice, etc. Uh, content fitness. Uh, so this is an interesting idea. Uh, so he's bringing in, uh, let's see, Huang, Li, and Wang. Uh, users base their judgments of the quality of information more on how well that information matches what they are seeking and less on how sophisticated the site is. So that, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't sound all that uh, uh, brilliant the way they've got it worded there, but if you think about what they're saying, it's, it, it's pretty, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have uh, expected that. You know, so basically, you could have a very low uh, tech site. Basically, uh, that's not really going to make the difference whether it's really sleek. You know, a lot of moving parts. Uh, it's more about you know how well are you matching up with their expectations, right? And then they uh, talk about well, why are they there? Are they there to buy something? Uh, then these things will shift if they're there to learn something, and so on. Uh, so maybe that's why Wikipedia has done so well. Maybe precisely because it, it it does it looks, you know it it it's very appropriate for the type of information they're trying to uh, to spread the encyclopedic format. You know, just imagining if it was like if you go to Wikipedia and there were all these videos everywhere and it was like uh, you know real slick you know flashy interface, <laughs> uh, you'd probably think eh, I don't know this just doesn't uh, it doesn't feel right. Now you might even affect your judgment of the quality of the info. Uh, so let's see, they've got these categories here, IQ categories, not intelligence quotient, but information quality. So the intrinsic IQ, the information has quality for the user in its own right. Uh, so something like, we go to Wikipedia looking, I want to learn about air fryers. <laughs> it's like, and I'm there, you know, so I want, of course, accurate information, uh, objectivity. Exactly, I don't want the air fryer people, brands or whatever there on Wikipedia telling me, about the best air fryer. You know, I want an objective uh, account. Uh, let's see, contextual IQ, information that must be considered within the context of the user's tasks. All right, so maybe I've I'm, I got some biscuits here, I need to cook them, I got people coming. <laughs> you know, I need something quick, right? Uh, representational IQ, user issues surrounding systems that provide the information, such as a database. Uh, so there, that would, uh, I guess, you know, how easy is it to use the database? Can you interpret the results easily? Uh, or do you need a PhD to make sense of it? Uh, and then accessibility IQ, surrounding provisions of information. Right, so, we, you know, most people are concerned about these things. You know, I don't want, you might not want uh, everybody to know you've been on this site or doing these searches. Or, you know, if there's anything related like uh, buying, you know, you're like, I'm not going to put my credit card info into this, <laughs> you know, uh, iffy looking site. Uh, so those are, you know, I think these, this is a useful table. Uh, moving on, he talks about how to identify your audience. He just says at the basic level, you want to know this stuff, you know, where does your audience live? Are they local, national, or international? So I've done this. You get on YouTube and you could find out about your audience demographics and they will uh, tell you things like what, what the countries are they from, uh, what languages do they speak, uh, what's their uh, gender. Uh, you know, on mine, it's 
I'm, it's always kind of fascinating to see. I don't know why this is, but I have this large chunk of uh, people from Europe. Uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans uh, watch the uh, uh, Matt Chat show. So that's something to consider, right? When I'm making analogies and things, if I'm talking about uh, football, they probably think I'm talking about soccer. You know, of course, most of uh, the audience is from the U.S., but it, it's something to think about again. Uh, it's certainly not just a Minnesota audience. You know, this is uh, international. Now, let's see, what kind of sites, publications, and apps your audience uses already? Right, so I know they're looking at other YouTube channels, uh, for one thing, but maybe they're on uh, these other sites. And if I can find out like what forums they like and where they get the news, you know, then I can target those uh, areas. Or I can find out, conversely, you know, if I, if I find myself mentioned on like this forum, uh, then I know, well, that must be where some of my audience is. Let's see, where your interactors go to satisfy their information needs. Uh, their ages, occupations, gender, income levels, education levels, races, and ethnicities. Now, some of this stuff would be difficult, if not impossible, to get to get at. But you know, you just see what tool you're using, what kind of stats uh, you can collect. Let's see challenges. Their challenges accessing information. Uh, cultural factors that might influence what you do and do not do. Yeah, that's certainly something to consider. Uh, there as well, you know, if you do have a large uh, international audience, uh, you know, they're not going to all be on the same page. <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of things, uh, not just with what sports they prefer, but you know, down to like core values sometimes. Uh, so you definitely like to know about that. Let's see, information architecture. How should you plan and organize your info? Uh, so he does mention that there's a whole. You know, there's basically whole college majors. You could, you could major in this <laughs> if you really want the details. So obviously we can't get into the, you know, you can't learn everything you need about this from one slide. <laughs> uh, but you can sort of get the gist of it, right? When you're putting together your my uh, your WordPress page, it'll give you some options. You got different templates. You can a lot of those templates will let you move menu items around. Uh, again, creating catalog. Uh, terms or categories and keywords and tagging things. It's really all about this, how to organize the information so somebody can find what they're looking for. Uh, you know, I don't like to talk bad about my employer, but, you know, St. Cloud State, they're, they're terrible at this. You know, even me, you know, I go there trying to find some kind of forum, uh, you know, for, you know, when's the graduation, you know, just basic info. And it's, it can be really challenging to, to find uh, the info. Uh, so they really, I don't, you know, some things they do well, but that is something that could use uh, some improvement. And that basically is a problem of uh, information information architecture. And so it's just something about the way they've laid out the menus and the, the search terms, the way that search bar works. But anyway, you can see here how they got this laid out, just services about us and, and a contact button. Uh, here's a very, uh, typically with this, when you're looking at a question like this, my first instinct is always to say, go to see if you could find some good examples. You know, find somebody else with the site, basically like the one you want to create. <laughs> uh, take a couple of those and see if you could find out what works well, what doesn't work well. Of course, take the best, don't do the worst, and you might be able to create something uh, uh, that's workable at least and refine it from there uh, based on feedback. Uh, but anyway, it is a big, big topic. Uh, then he moves into style guides. I think you probably enjoyed that. He gets in down into like issues like, well, is it email with a hyphen and a capital? Is it email with a hyphen? Is it just one word email? And you know, a lot of students, uh, they're not aware that these are, you know, it's not like there's a, 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 a set in stone somewhere. <laughs> it, it, will, it is email with just all one word. You know, a lot of this just has to do with the uh, style guide of that particular publication. Uh, so we've got things like APA, which I have pictured here. Uh, there's one called Chicago. So these are, I, I don't know where they all these originate from. This one's obviously uh, comes out of psychology in, in America. Uh, but the MLA has one, Modern Language Association for their journals. Uh, but then there's all these ones for newspapers uh, that a lot of people use. Uh, there's the Wired style guide. Uh, so the, the idea is that it's not like that one is necessarily better than the other. You know, email like this versus email like that. You know, we, it's still email. 
Uh, the point is you just have to pick something <laughs> and stick with it and not just keep switching around and sometimes it's one thing, one thing it's another. Uh, so that's where these style guides come in handy. And you could imagine if you're working with a team, you know, a bunch of different writers come in, they've got 17 different ways to write email. You say, no, we, we're all going to do it this way according to this manual that we've all uh, read and subscribed to. So it's very useful in that sense. And of course, you can create your own. Uh, again, the point is not that there's one right way to do it. Uh, the point is we just want to make sure that everybody on your blog is doing these things the same way because uh, otherwise it'll just look... Uh, It'll look shoddy, start looking like there's uh, errors all over the place. You know, one of these uh, things that come up in my uh, other class, my video games class, is, you know, how do you write video games? Is it two words? Is it one word? Is it capitalized? And even, the, you know, the authors of that book, unfortunately, they just write it sometimes one word, sometimes two words. It's kind of, uh, kind of uh, obvious they didn't really apply a style guide. And what they should have done is just choose one and just stuck with it, not kept uh, switching. Uh, and then we get into ethics. I wanted to pull up this link here. This is the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. I think it's worth our time to really look at this closely. So this goes out, I suppose, to the... Let me get this a little bigger. Uh, to anybody studying journalism... Let's see, there are Ten Commandments, I guess. Uh, seek truth and report it. Ethical journalism should be accurate and fair. Journalists should be honest and courageous in gathering, repeating, and interpreting information. So you notice the book kind of leaves it there, but if you look at this manual I'm showing you here, they, they go into uh, details, you know, like provide the context, be cautious when making a promise, identify the source clearly, Consider sources' motives before promising anonymity. So these are just really smart. Be vigilant and courageous about holding those with power accountable. Give voice to the voiceless. Boldly tell the story of the diversity and magnitude of the human experience. Seek sources whose voices we seldom hear. So some of this is, uh, I think, probably more aspirational. Uh, but, you know, these are good ethics. Let's see, minimize harm. Ethical journalism treats sources, subjects, colleagues, and members of the public as human beings deserving of respect. Pursuit of the news is not a license for arrogance or undue intrusiveness. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, avoid pandering to lurid <laughs> curiosity, even if others do. I guess that, that to me sounds like, don't be paparazzi. Act independently. The highest and primary obligation of ethical journalism is to serve the public. Journalists should avoid conflicts of interest, real or perceived. Disclose unavoidable conflicts. Refuse gifts, favors, fees, free travel, and special treatment. And avoid political and other outside activities that may compromise integrity or impartiality or may damage credibility. Clearly, a lot of people working in journalism today have not read that. <laughs> you know, they uh, coming back to the video games class again. Uh, there is a lot of controversy lingering about the uh, these these gaming magazines and websites that review games. And I've talked to a few of these reviewers, and they they talk about this all the time. How these big game pump companies will be coming out with a new uh, Call of Duty or whatever it is, and they will just basically wine and dine them uh, I had a one of my students work for a company or before he came to uh, St. Cloud State he was doing a website about uh, I think it was cheat cheat codes <laughs> for games <laughs> uh, but it, the site got big enough where he was you know he was being uh, uh, approached by all these big game studios to get him to do reviews uh, of, you know the big upcoming games you know they like to get a bunch of reviews all at once and kind of just have this big burst of a publicity when the game comes out. Uh, but he, the stuff he was telling me, I just was like, really? You know, like, like a first class flight out to some like tropical uh, island and, you know, or cruises and just all this stuff, you know, free, uh, best of everything, <laughs> steaks, <laughs> steak dinners, cocktails. <laughs> you know, it's basically just, a, uh, I think he might have been like 19 or 20. Uh, so I hope he didn't, uh, 
you know, I don't know what they did with the uh, alcohol. Uh, but anyway, just basically, literally just whining and dining the crap out of, uh, you know, these reviewers and then being like, oh, and by the way, here's our new game, you know, go play <laughs> for a while. And, you know, write an objective review, you know, of course. Uh, you know, so it's just like one story after another like that. And it just really made me think that there's, uh, you know, people laugh at this or whatever, but they, there definitely needs to be some uh, major scrutiny especially in that gaming uh, journalism uh, world. Okay, let's see. Be accountable and transparent. Uh, journalists should explain ethical choices and processes to audiences, encourage a civil dialogue with the public, respond quickly to questions about accuracy, clarity, and fairness. All right, so there you go. I guess there, was, there weren't, it wasn't 10. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five... Uh, so that's the for journalism. Clearly, you know, you're not all doing, uh, you know, news blogs. But I still think it's very useful. That's a really good example. Really, you could tell they put a lot of thought into that. Uh, they really approached it well. So I think you could do worse than to really study that, uh, those examples. And think about how you might adapt that for your blog. Okay, so the first step in doing your own code of ethics, he says, is to define the goal. What do you need to decide, and when do you need to decide it? So he says, you know, inevitably something's going to arise. There will be some kind of ethical dilemma. Could be minor, could be major. Uh, the point is you need to have some process in place to be able to handle this. In a, you Basically, you want to set this up while you're calm and collected and cool and rational <laughs> and have a good process worked out because in the heat of the moment, you know, you're, you're not, you might not be thinking clearly. You probably won't be. And so it's great to have something you can fall back on to process, something you've trained and practiced. And so, yeah, what do you need to decide? What, what is the thing that's happened? You know, has there been some kind of scandal? Has there been some fraud committed? You know, recently, we, you know, we had the Target Corporation here in Minnesota, so I get a lot of students that are working for Target or looking for careers with Target. Uh, and then one of the things that always comes up is the the breaches of security right so target has all these apps and things and it's not just target you know a lot of these big corporations so every now and then there'll be this catastrophic leak and they find all the customers credit card numbers or social security numbers or you know all this information is is gets gets leaked out somehow uh, so now the uh, executives at target have to figure out like well what what do we do you know should we keep it under wraps uh, if we're going to come forward with this, you know, how, what's the best way to do it? So you can think about a situation like that, you know, not necessarily, uh, might not even be Target's fault. You know, that might not even be the point here. Uh, the point could just be how do we break this uh, to the public in, the, <laughs> in a strategic way? Uh, so that'd be that. You know, what do you need to decide and when do you need to decide it? So that might, it could just be, should we, should we just keep it secret or should we uh, report this? Should we do a a video about it you know there's, there's lots of questions there uh, step two start with the ends uh, so thinking about the end results uh, so he's asked us this what do you know for sure you know what details do we have about the breach Just stick with that example you know what can you independently verify and corroborate you know maybe you don't know anything about who did this uh, what country <laughs> they're from or anything maybe you do maybe you don't uh, you, you definitely want to make sure you had your facts uh, before you went out, uh, you know, with a press release. Uh, what are the facts from the point of view of those who might be harmed by your decision? All right, so if you don't tell people, uh, I would argue that the your customers might be harmed by that because you know, maybe they're suddenly getting hacked, uh, their information's out there, uh, their credit cards are, get, people are charging things to their credit cards. Uh, who knows all what might happen. So I think that would be pretty clear that <laughs> you would do a lot of harm to your customers if you didn't tell them what happened. Uh, step three, know your purpose. Now, what does the audience need? Well, they probably need to know about this breach so that they can uh, begin to uh, change, you know, call their bank, say cancel that card, change the passwords, etc. cetera. Uh, what are your obligations in terms of the information you should provide that audience? You know, so how much detail do you need to provide about, uh, you know, your negligence 
<laughs> you know, you probably don't want to just spell out exactly how they exploited you because uh, other hackers might use that information themselves on, on other companies. You know, so that's a kind of a something to think about. Let's see, step four, consider the ethical principles at stake. So this is where you'd have the, he's got a big list of like all your values. I think this would be a good exercise for you and your blog. You know, just think about what are the things you value? Uh, is, it, is it about reporting the truth? Is that the main value? Is it more about serving the public interest, protecting independence? Uh, you know, not getting, uh, you know, one of the things that comes up sometimes with a blog is somebody wants to sponsor you. You know, some company or studio or whatever uh, related to your uh, blog might say, I would like to, you know, put some ads on your channel. Uh, you know, even with Matt Chat, I've got the Patreon set up. And, you know, usually I'm kind of like, uh, you know, it's mostly just small donors, you know, like a dollar here, five dollars there. You know, but what if, uh, you know, some big time producer uh, was saying, look, I will, uh, you know, I'll give you $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or whatever, just some crazy amount of money. Uh, but, you know, the expectation is going to be that, you know, from now on, when you review any of our games, or I want you to really talk about our stuff all the time. Uh, I might say that wouldn't really work because then I wouldn't be independent anymore. I would basically just be a shill, <laughs> for, you know, for that studio. Uh, so that'd be an example there. Uh, helping those in need. So you, as you can see, th this is going to be completely different. You're just going to have to think about your own blog, your own values. Uh, the point is just to figure out what are your principles, and then uh, how do you rank those? What's more important to you? What's less important? Uh, step five, identify the principles in conflict. Uh, yes, because anytime there's an ethical crisis, it's a crisis because you are, uh, you know, it, it may, you're trying to figure out, okay, this, this is a matter of protecting the independence versus... Um, one of the other values might be to be sustainable, <laughs> right? Or, uh, you know, to, to continue making the show. All right? We don't want to run out of money. Uh, so you could look at those values and say, well, those are in conflict there. Uh, how am I going to resolve this? Uh, serving the public interest. You know, what if somebody told you something? And I can imagine this coming up in journalism. You know, I'll just give you an example from Matt Chat again. And so sometimes I'll have a guest on and they'll say, look, uh, I'm going to tell you something, but I don't want it on the show. I don't want you to tell anybody. <laughs> you know, this is just between us. And so in those situations, uh, I never know what, quite what to do. Should I just say, well, just, you know, don't tell me whatever that is. <laughs> because, you know, it puts me like, what if it's something horrible? And I feel like, well, I should probably tell people about that. Uh, now I'm kind of in this conundrum, this quandary. Uh, now that I know something, and you know, so there's all sorts of bad badness you can get into. So it probably would behoove me to practice some of the stuff in this book and just have us say, well, here's my policy on that. You know, bada boom. Uh, in most cases, uh, okay. Uh, step six: identify the stakeholders. So the again, if you're in news, the sources. That's a good. I was just talking about that, right? Like the, I got to protect the source. You know, they've told me something anonymous, or they told me something confidential, uh, and I don't want to just go out and, uh, you know, if I go out and tell people, then in, in a way I'm kind of throwing them under the bus. Uh, this comes up, of course, in IRB, if you're doing any kind of research on campus with uh, students or any really any kind of research involving what they call human subjects. <laughs> Weird term, but basically if you're working on people, uh, then you have to make sure that you're doing that ethically, that you're protecting them. Uh, and there's even arguments now that they should get something out of it, right? That it shouldn't just be you taking from them. Uh, they should get some, some kind of value uh, from that study. Uh, subjects, clients, uh, families, institutions, right? So maybe something would be uh, good for the, a student, but maybe it would not be good for the institution or, or vice versa. And so all these things can come into conflict. Let's see, step seven, identify your options. Uh, make sure you put all of the options on the table. So there might be some kind of compromise type situation, right? Where you say, well, I'm not going to, I don't know about sponsorship or that, you know, maybe I will do, <clears throat> you know, maybe I could do like a special <laughs> uh, video where I make it clear that this is an advertisement or this video was sponsored. 
you know, kind of set that apart somehow, uh, you know, so that it's clear to the viewers that this was basically paid content. I'll make sure that's screened off from the regular match chats. And maybe there's something like that that could be done uh, instead of just, you know, yes or no. Let's see, step eight, evaluating those options. So we've got all the options on the table. We're going through them each, each one, thinking about what, you know, what's going to minimize the harm, what's going to be the most effective. Uh, step nine, make a choice. All things considered, what is the best option? Well, I thought this was probably the best part of this whole process. Step 10, testing your thinking. So he says, imagine being interviewed on 60 Minutes. <laughs> kind of like after the fact, I guess. So that's probably a, a great piece of advice. You know, how are you going to feel when you're on the in the hot seat and people are grilling you? Uh, so that's probably a good place to be. It might terrify you, but you know, on the other hand, the more you could prep and let this guide your decision, that's probably wise. <laughs> so in your justification, fill in these blanks. We have decided to blank. Decided to turn down the offer, accept the offer, uh, report you know give the information regardless that it was confidential uh, who knows uh, but then there's more we re reached the decision after weighing you know fill in the blank there what did you weigh what factors uh, we also considered you know, whatever that is uh, we think this decision best upholds the principle of blah 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 and they say transparency builds trust so that's kind of what this is about, right? We've looked at these other options. We considered, you know, maybe not reporting this or reporting uh, uh, keeping it under wraps or something. Uh, but then we decided that the, you know, we would tell the people, hey, the the accounts have been compromised. <laughs> and it's a terrible thing, you know. All right, so go back to question, uh, the question from earlier where we're looking at those bad apologies. So I think it'd be, now that we kind of worked through these steps, ethical codes and whatnot, uh, so see if you can sort of reverse engineer or step back from that apology back to what happened. You know, what happened that led to this crisis where they needed to apologize? Where did, where did they screw up? <laughs> so find out where the person, company, or organization failed in terms of Carol's ethics process. Which steps could and probably should have been handled better? All right, so just to wrap up here, uh, work out the process before the crisis. I think this is worth repeating. Uh, this is on page 230. Carol says, while it's fine to listen to your butt, it should be gut. While it's fine to listen to your gut, <laughs> don't let that gut reaction fool you into thinking that you know the answer before working through the issues. All right, so again, uh, the whole point of this process is to have something that you have put together while you're in a state of calmness very very rational uh, so you work this all out beforehand so that when you are in the moment and yeah you think well oh no what you know what do i do don't don't just act uh, sp spontaneously you know the idea is you want to go back work through your process don't you know, even if you think you know the answer uh just ignore that you still want to go through those uh, steps that we talked about all right uh anyway uh, thanks for watching hope this was uh, useful to you thanks for your time and attention uh, please do leave a comment, ask a question, or just, you know, let me know how you're feeling. It's getting about that time of the semester, I think. I know you got a lot on your plate. Love to hear from you. Uh, anyway, have a great day.